This is part two of Practical Prayer, and we're going to be talking about the sitter today specifically, but before we actually open our sitters, I just want to review one topic with you really quickly, and that is regarding the use of Hashem's names. Now, this is for you guys, it's probably entirely review for all of you, but because I don't know who's going to watch it, who needs more information, I'm going to share it anyway, okay? So we're going to quickly review the use of Hashem's name. So it's our custom not to actually pronounce the names of God unless we're involved in prayer to God or reading a complete verse from the Torah. Those are the only two times that we're supposed to actually say God's name. All of the rest of the time as a way of honoring Hashem and as a way of uh, protecting and sanctifying the holiness of his name and to make sure that we don't get casual. And that's really a very interesting thing because there is a point in the Torah where Hashem says, because you act casually towards me, I will act casually towards you. So even though in common society, you know, you think of, you know, I've heard the argument that why would you call God by a different name? And I've used the example of, um, you know, I don't call my mother Miriam. I don't call my mother Miriam, right? I call her mom or Ima or some other uh, term of endearment back in the day, many, many years ago before my generation. Uh, people might actually refer to their parents as mother and father um, because it's a sign of respect to not call somebody by their first name. In this case, you know, we say Hashem, Hashem means the name. And God is kind of like saying, God is kind of like saying, um, you know, Father, right? And you could call God Father too. But anyway, so it um, even the changing of God's name, like if we say Elokeinu, right? So some people have said, well, that's like corrupting God's name and that's not respectful. But it is if it is done, see, so much of Judaism is about our intention, right? Why are we doing it? We're not doing it to slight God or to be casual with God. We're doing it the actual opposite. We're doing it to make sure that we don't transgress the prohibition of speaking God's name in vain. And so it's just like, you know, how, um, you know, we call our mother Ima or mommy, but, um, in other cultures and other societies, they use different terms. Sometimes they'll use, you know, maybe you don't want to call your mom mommy. You want to call her um, momsy or, you know, something like that, right? It's not disrespectful unless it's being done in a disrespectful way. And the whole point of why we do it is out of respect for God. So this is one of the reasons, you know, because of our awesome respect for God and the power of his name, that we tend to use the word Hashem all the time, right? So you will often hear the names of Hashem, such as Eloheinu, pronounced Elokeinu, and the same happens with the various forms of Hashem's name. Now, I just said Hashem's, one of Hashem's names, and I wasn't praying, and I wasn't reading a verse from the Torah, right? Because there is an exception to the rule. And that is for educational purposes, where a student might not understand what we're trying to teach. It's considered acceptable. So you may hear me pronounce Hashem's name properly sometimes and not properly other times. Just recently, my, my, I had my oldest son 
record uh, the Kiddush for Shabbat for one of my students who needed something to practice along with so he could get more confident. And he asked me, should I record it with Hashem's name or without Hashem's name? And even though he wasn't making Kiddush at the time that he was recording it, I asked him to go ahead and make it with Hashem's name so that the student can learn it smoothly and would be able to do it smoothly when they find finally do the Kiddush themselves, okay? If any of you men or women, for that matter, need a copy of, want a copy of the recordings of my son doing Kiddush, I thought I had posted it to the event from last week, but uh, just, you know, post a, a comment on the event and I'll be happy to um, upload the audio or give you a link to the audio so that you can hear it and download it for yourself so you can use it to practice with. Okay, now in the front of every sitter, there is a page with your name on it. No, um, there is a table of contents. See that? Now it turns out that the art scroll interlinear sitter, the table of contents is laid out very, very usably. I guess it's user friendly. Um, but if you open to the table of contents in your sitter, so I'm telling you guys now, this is maybe not interactive in that you're not conversing with me during the class, but it is interactive in that it's like a workshop. I want you to get your hands dirty. So <clears throat> if you have a sitter with you, or if you have an online sitter program that you're using, open up to the table of contents and um, you know every publisher actually puts things in a slightly different order even in the same new socks sometimes you'll find one or two things that are in a slightly different order that's why it's also that's why they put the table of contents here but um, and some publishers include some things that others do not like you may notice um, like in my sitter here it says um, Shacharit starts on page 83 and the Shema is on page 123. Now Shacharit um, and, and the Shema is on 143. So between 123 and 143, it's not like the Shema is 20 pages long. Okay, there's other stuff in there, right? Or, um, you know, the Mourner's Kaddish is at 243. I mean, there's a lot more stuff than what's actually listed in the front page in the um, table of contents. I'm trying to get this so that you can actually see it and see my face. But um, so I want everybody to open to the table of contents and um, you will notice that like mine includes, it says upon rising, then that includes the morning blessings. And then it says shacharit or shacharis, depending on what version you have. And that's the morning, um, the morning prayer service. Right, and then it has all kinds of other blessings, including grace after meals, including the um, birchat hamazan, okay, or the benching, and then it says mincha, and then it says mariv. Um, by the way, in Israel, mariv is called aravit. They have the same root. It's just uh, I'm not even sure. Excuse me, I'm not even sure why they pronounce it, why they use the different forms of the word, but it comes from erev, meaning evening. Right, so Mariv is the evening, or Aravit is the evening prayers. Um, and then it has um, the conclusion of Shabbat, and then it has all kinds of other things for the different holidays, Hanukkah, Purim, uh, and all kinds of other stuff like that. We're not going to go that far. We're basically going to be primarily on this page here. Um, so if you, have, if you have a sitter like mine, then this is pretty much what we're going to be covering during the course of this course. All right, so some sitters include both weekday and Shabbat and holiday prayers. Other publishers have two separate sitters, one for weekday and one for Shabbat and holidays. The, um, the uh, interlinear sitter like, like I have here has a separate sitter for weekdays and for Shabbat. Sitters that are in Hebrew uh, only are usually all in one. And some of the sitters that are Hebrew and English is, um, are also all in one, like the older art scroll that's not interlinear, but that has the Hebrew 
like a Hebrew paragraph and then the English paragraph and the Hebrew paragraph and the English paragraph. That's also an all in one. Uh, but with the interlinear, because it just it takes up a lot more space the way that they print it, they have two volumes. It doesn't matter. They still contain the same things. All right. Additional sections. In addition to the five sections that I listed here, which was the morning blessings, Shachari, morning prayer service, Mincha, Marev, and the various blessings section, um, which we're going to focus on. Most sitters also include, like I said, grace after meals, Havdalah, blessing of the moon, bedtime Shema is a separate thing, Hallel, Musaf, which is the additional prayer service on Shabbat and the holidays, certain special Torah readings. Some sitters also include Tehillim and other things as well. Now, for the purpose of this course, um, we're only going to look at the weekday prayers, even though when we get to the Amida and or Shmona Esrei, I will briefly touch on the differences between the weekday Shmona Esrei and the Shabbat Shmona Esrei. But for the most part, we're just going to be looking at the weekday prayers. And I feel like if you're really comfortable with the weekday service, the Shacharit service, then when you do Shabbat, it will, you'll still be mostly all the way there. Okay. So for most of your life, these five sections are really the ones that you need to be most concerned about. Now, if you'll recall from last week, I did mention that there's some debate as to whether or not women are obligated to pray from the sitter at all. And among those who say, yes, there's an obligation to at least pray something from the sitter, there are disagreements as to how much is the minimum to which a woman is obligated. And because there are time limitations as to when one is permitted to daven each of these three different prayer services, many women take upon themselves only to daven mincha, which is the midday prayer service, because it has the largest open time window in which it can be prayed. So if you're going to pray one full prayer service, it makes sense that it would be mincha. Um, although many of those women will also do the morning blessings, which we'll be talking about in a minute before they do anything else during the day. Now, since there is some debate as to whether or not Mariv is an actual obligation, even for men, most women, although <laughs> I got some argument when I said that the last time, it was, it, it comes from a source that I read that, um, that, you know, Mariv was made obligatory at a very late point in the development of Judaism. And so there are some who question whether it's actually a, a requirement to daven in a minion, to daven Mariv. Um, but women usually, because of that, don't commit to davening mariv. So if they're going to if they're going to commit to davening one of the services only, they'll usually commit to davening mincha because it's short and it has the biggest time window. Um, or like me, they'll commit to doing um, to doing shacharit. But depending on the the amount of time that they have, as you'll see in a minute, because I have a chart, um, they will. Uh, what was I going to say? Prioritize and, and choose to do certain ones depending on how much time they have. Okay. So the morning blessings are preliminary prayers that are said before the morning service. They're said before Shacharit actually begins. And they're designated or designed rather, they're designed to get us into the right mindset of the day. They focus us on the fact that we've been given another day to fulfill the purpose for which we were created, but also to begin the day with gratitude for the miracles of life and the fact that we've been given all of the resources we need to accomplish that purpose. So today we're going to look at the morning brachot and also a few of the additional prayers. Next week we'll start to look at shacharit and um, continue from there. All right. So last week I mentioned that in every sitter, the first prayer at the beginning of the sitter is moda'ani. So um, take your sitter and you probably don't have to turn. I mean, there's a lot of like commentary here at the very beginning, but you don't have to turn too many pages. OK, so there's like they put another uh, divider page here to show that we're starting the actual prayer book section. And look at that. Lo and behold. Let's see. How do I do this? Um, it says upon, upon rising, this is backwards, upon rising. And this is, this, this is, ah, there we go. The Moda'ani prayer. Okay. Moda'ani. So it is the first prayer in every sitter, right? Because as I said last week,
speak briefly, it's the first thing we say in the morning. Now we're actually at the prayer, not Moda'ani, but which is usually the third prayer in the Siddur, okay? Um, we did look at Moda'ani yesterday, uh, sorry, last week. It's short, but very important and very special. And um, I encouraged you to print off a copy of Moda'ani and to tape it somewhere where you can see it as soon as you open your eyes in the morning so that you can make that a practice. That should be the first thing you do before you get concerned about praying anything else. If you're not praying Moda'ani every morning, that's what you should focus on because it is life changing. Just out of curiosity, if any of you have taken on to start davening Moda'ani and you weren't doing it before and it's kind of changed your life in some way, maybe make a comment in the comments on the video and let me know that it's made um, that it's made a difference in your life because it has for me. Waking up every morning with the um, idea of focusing on God, right? Because we, we talked a little bit about the fact that modani, the first word is not I, right? Like I'm grateful, but it's grateful am I. And there's oh, so much significance just in those two words. This idea of, you know, when we wake up and we first become aware of the world that we're conscious again, we are conscious of us, ourselves, right? So by making the moda ani prayer start with the word moda instead of ani, it changes our focus from me, oh, my mouth is dry, my breath stinks, my head hurts, my nose is stuffed, whatever, I need to go to the bathroom, right? Instead of focusing, our first focus being on ourselves, our first focus is on being grateful. Grateful to who? Grateful to Hashem. So um, it's really very, very important thing that you to do and should be your main focus. But the prayer that is said more times than any other prayer, it is called the Asher Yatsar. So in this case, um, in my sitter, right after Moda'ani and Reshit Chachma, which we're going to skip over, but I highly recommend that you actually read it. Uh, Reshit Chachma, it come, the first line anyway, comes from Tehillim 111, and it's talking about the beginning of wisdom. Um, but the next prayer in mine is the donning of the tzitzit and the talit, and that actually takes a little bit. Let's fill in. There's an introductory prayer. Right, and then the beginning of, it says the morning blessings, and the first, well, the first prayer is washing your hands, and then the next prayer in my sitter is Asher Yatsar, which is the one that we're going to do. Okay, so this prayer is the one prayer that if you don't memorize any other prayer in the sitter, you need to memorize this. Start working on it now. You must memorize it because of how many times a day you need to say it. Now, I suppose if you're a camel and you don't go to the bathroom that often, maybe you won't say it very often, which I'll explain why I said that in just a second. But for the rest of us, it's something that is said many times a day. And of course, if you say it wherever you're supposed to, uh, whenever you're supposed to, it actually won't take long for you to have it memorized. So this prayer is called Asher Yatsar. And it is the prayer that we say after going to the bathroom. First thing in the morning, we say Moda'ani in bed. Then we wash our hands. Some people, depending on how far the bathroom is from your bed, some people will have a bowl with a washing cup filled with water beside their bed. They cover it overnight and there's a whole Kabbalistic reason for that because we don't want impurities to creep in because the reason we're washing our hands first thing in the morning is to get rid of the impurities that the spiritual impurities that come upon us while we're sleeping so um the first thing in the morning we say moda ani and like i said last week it doesn't have hashem's name so that there's no problem with saying it while we're in an impure state or half dressed or whatever right? Because it's not disrespectful to Hashem because we're not saying his name. Um, and then we wash our hands either in the bowl that we keep next to the bed or in the bathroom. If you have an ensuite bathroom that's right next to your bedroom or in your bedroom, you know, or very close to your bedroom. It, it depends on how far you have to walk, whether or not you should have a bowl beside your bed. Um, 
course, it's also going to be dependent upon whether you have space. In Israeli homes, there's not a lot of room in a bedroom for a thing of water, and it could possibly get knocked over. But for example, for us, we have a bathroom that's attached to our bedroom, so we don't wash from a bowl next to the bed. We get up and take three steps into the bathroom. Um, and we wash our hands and we say the bracha, we step out of the bathroom, if we're in the bathroom, and we say the bracha al netilat yadayim. Now, there are different customs, which I'll explain in a minute, but we wash our hands. And then after we go to the bathroom, we're going to wash our hands again. But after we go to the bathroom, we then say this prayer called Asher Yatsar. Now, those are the first three prayers we say every day. But no prayer is said more often, like I said, unless you're a camel, than uh, Asher Yatsar. So now before we actually look at the Asher Yatsar, let me give you a few words of protocol, okay? We don't pray when we are in a place that's dirty or smelly, simply out of respect for God. And even the cleanest bathroom qualifies as a dirty place. So we don't pray when we're in the bathroom. So what do we do? We finish our business, we wash our hands, we wash our hands with a cup. Some people don't um, do this in the bathroom, but they actually go to the kitchen or if they have a sink outside the bathroom, they go to, to do that. Uh, many homes in Israel and also in England have um, a separate room with a bathtub, um, usually a bathtub and a sink. I'm not sure whether the toilet and the sink are together. But anyway, the point is, is that um, most people will, many people will step outside of the bathroom to find a place to wash their hands with the washing cup to, um, but you can wash with the washing cup in the bathroom, just some people don't. If you washed in the bathroom though, then you step outside the bathroom and you recite the Asher Yatsar prayer, okay? If you used a public bathroom, even though, even if you didn't have a cup, and can only wash your hands the regular way, you come outside the bathroom and then you recite the Asher Yatsar before going on to whatever else you need to do. Now, that scenario should explain to you right now why you need to memorize this prayer. It's not that long, it's not that hard to do, and if you make it your purpose, your intention to say it every day, uh, let's say for a week or whatever, you'll get you'll get it memorized and you'll get in the habit of doing it and then you won't even need to have it in front of you. Although it's preferable to be able to, to read any prayer. It's always preferable to read a prayer from a sitter or even a card than um, to do it from memory because our memories fail. But also um, if we're not reading it from a sitter or from a piece of paper, there's always the temptation to just say the words while we're doing something else. And anytime you pray, you should be concentrating on the meaning of the prayer that you're praying. So um, as I said, if you use the public bathroom, even if you didn't have a cup and could only wash the regular way, you come outside the bathroom and you recite the Yashar Asher Atsar before going on to whatever else you need to do. You don't pray the prayer for washing the hands first. That's only done first thing in the morning when washing for bread, okay? So let me clarify what that means, uh, and when washing for bread, okay? So first thing in the morning, you're going to wake up, you're going to say, Moda'ani, um, then you're going to wash your hands, either beside your bed, or you go over to the bathroom and you quickly take the, um, the cup, and it's interesting, because I thought I had this explained in my notes, but I don't. So you take the cup in, your right hand, you fill the cup, you move it to your left hand, and unlike when we wash bread, how do we wash when we wash bread, right? We pour two times or three times, depending on your custom, over the right hand, and then two or three times over the left hand, and that's how we wash for bread. But how we wash for getting rid of impurities, which is what we do first thing in the morning and after going to the bathroom, is we wash alternately, okay? So you're gonna fill the cup with your right hand, Move it to your left hand, wash once on the right, once on the left, once on the right, once on the left. And there are lots of different customs as to how to do that, how many times you're supposed to do this. Um, my custom is that um, first thing in the morning, I do it seven times. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, but during the rest of the day, if I only had liquid waste, I do five. 
All right, and I'm not going to get into the Kabbalistic meanings behind the numbers. I'm just telling you what is fairly common practice and the way to do it. So unlike the way that we wash before bread, we wash alternately, okay? And except for the first thing in the morning, when we say al netila yadayim and then asher yatsar, the rest of the day when you go to the bathroom, you don't say al netila yadayim, okay? You only say, you wash, and then you say asher yatsar. The only time during the rest of the day that you say on the tilat yadayim is when you wash for bread. All right, is that clear for everybody? What we're talking about now is the Asher Yatsar prayer, and we're going to take a look at it together. And it is, as I said, the first major prayer in the section of the morning blessings. All right, and it starts in English with Blessed are you, Hashem, our God. King of the universe who created mankind with wisdom. So I'll give you a couple of seconds to find it as long as you have it. So what does it say? It says, uh, and I could do it in Hebrew for you, but it's really probably not so necessary. Blessed are you, God, Lord our God, King of the universe, who created mankind with wisdom and created within him many inner organs and cavities. It's obvious before your throne of glory that if even one of them were to open or if even one of them were to be blocked, it would be impossible to survive and stand here before you. Blessed are you, God, who heals all flesh and acts wondrously. Now, this prayer is super powerful and it's an acknowledgement that we are incredibly created, complex, and beautiful. It implies that the functions of the human body are one of the best proofs of God's existence that we have. And let's face it, going to the bathroom is something every animal does, right? It's a function of our animal soul. But people, and the Jewish people specifically, are called to elevate the common things of this world and make them spiritual. We are to cause them to be an act of serving God. So some people might think it's silly to say a prayer after going to the bathroom, but Judaism says, no, we're not the same as animals. So we take this most basic automatic function of the body and we elevate it into a conscious moment, an opportunity of intention. And we do this by stopping right outside the bathroom before we do anything else and we say one of the most incredible prayers in all of Jewish liturgy. Now, I've taken a bit of time with this prayer because it's so important to our Jewish life. Keep in mind also that once you have it memorized, it only takes a few, maybe, a, I think it takes less than two minutes to say it, even if you're fairly slow, okay? So it's not like if I stop and I say this bracha after every time I go to the bathroom, it's gonna add, you know, two hours to my day, it's just not true. Once you have it memorized, you can say it with devotion, with attention and intention, and it still will, only, will take less than two minutes, all right? Now, uh, as I said, keep in mind that though the order is a little different in each sitter, all of the prayers are basically the same. So in the Sephardi prayer book I was looking at when I prepared this class, the next prayer is one called Elohai Neshama, in my Siddur, the blessings over the Torah come before Elohai Nishama because we're not supposed to read any Torah before making these blessings. Since some of the prayers contain some verses from the Torah, some Siddur publishers put them first, but it doesn't really matter. Now we're going to find the Elohai Nishama prayer, okay? So if you look in the Siddur that I'm using here, Right, we had al netilat yadayim, and then we have asher yatsar, and um, then, like I said, mine has, the next thing is the blessings of the Torah, so I'm going to just skip over those, and the next prayer is Elohai Nishama, which is my God, the soul, all right, if you're looking for it in the English because you don't read Hebrew well, it's my God, the soul, all right prayer after Elohai, uh, after Asher Yatsar is Elohai Neshama. Now, I'm going to read the English for you. 
It says, my God, the soul that you have given me is pure. You created it. You fashioned it. You blew it into me and you safeguard it within me. And in the future, you will take it from me and return it to me in the afterlife. All the while that the soul is within me, I gratefully give thanks before you, my God and the God of my ancestors, God of all creations, master of all souls. Blessed are you, God, who restores souls to dead bodies. Now, what prayer does that sound like an elaboration of? It sounds like an elaboration of Moda'ani, right? What does Moda'ani say? Moda'ani says, thank you, Hashem, I'm grateful for you restoring my soul to me. Right, exactly. Modani, there we go. Now it's starting to show up. I guess I have to give more time. I'm impatient on these things. Um, right, it is an ex an elaboration of the Modani. The Modani was very short and to the point. Let's focus on God. Be grateful that we're awake, that we have another day to try to accomplish what we were created in this world to accomplish. Then, you know, we go to the bathroom, we wash off the impurities off of our hands. Now we're in a state where we can start to pray. Um, hopefully we've gotten dressed at this point, and now we're going to say the Elohai Nishama prayer, which is elaborating on this concept and thanking God for restoring our soul, for giving us another day, and acknowledging that he gave us this soul, he created it, he knows who we are, and um, that we are thankful that he gave us a soul that he allowed us to connect to him, that he is our God, and that he has given us the fact that we have a soul. Remember, the, the meditation, the focus, the intention on both the Moda'ani and on Elohim Shema is that we matter. We have a job to do. It's not finished. If he put our soul back in our body, if he gave us consciousness for another day, then we have a job to do. There's, you are a person of value, of worth. Otherwise, he wouldn't have given you that consciousness again, right? So now our job is to figure out what is our, what is it that we were given another day to accomplish in this world, okay? Okay, so next we come to what is actually referred to as the morning blessings. Now, this is a little confusing because we have the morning blessings and then we have the morning blessings. So the whole section, so <laughs> we have the morning blessings and the morning blessings. The term the morning blessings is the term that's used for all of the prayers that we say before we actually begin the shacharit service that you do in the shul. And yet the morning blessings is also a term which is used to refer to a series of 16 blessings. The first 14 are rather short and the last two are a bit longer and they thank Thank God for all of the things that he's provided for us. So if you are following with me in your sitter, um, it's possible or probable that um, after Elohai Nishama, you probably have the Torah blessings. Mine were before that. But then after that, you have what is called the morning blessings. And it starts the first one. It says, Baruch Ata Hashem Elokeinu Melech HaOlam Asher Natan, I'm reading this sideways. Asher Natan Lashachvi Bina. So, depending on which translation you have, it says, Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who gave the heart understanding. Or it may say, Who gave the rooster understanding. And I'll explain that in a second. Now, these blessings thank God for all of the things that He's provided for us. It's traditional to stand while saying these blessings and to face the Temple Mount. Now, if you live in a country other than Israel, that's really easy. Just hit, stand in the direction facing wherever Israel is. In the United States, that's east. Uh, in Australia, I'm guessing it's northwest, maybe? I'm not sure. Um, but you get the idea. In Israel, you face Jerusalem. If you're in Jerusalem, you face the Western Wall, um, the 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 place where the temple had been. And um, of course, it is if one is unable to stand, either because of health reasons or because you're on a bus or whatever, you can say these brachot 
seated, okay? It is okay to say them seated. It's preferable to say them standing, but it's okay to say them while seated. All right, I'm going to read the English translation for you. Actually, I'm going to read them in Hebrew as well, but because I have to do it from a sitter because I didn't put it in my notes. The first bracha says, and I'm saying, I'm not saying Hashem's name, Baruch atah Hashem Elokeinu melech haolam asher natan l'shachvi bina l'havchin ben yom uvein laila. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who gave the heart understanding to distinguish between day and night. Now, it's interesting to note that, um, I'm just, one second. No, I thought I had this in my notes and I didn't, so I'm just going to have to tell you from the top of my head. Um, Shavi, uh, le Shavi Bina. Okay, Bina is an ability to make a distinction, right? Bina is understanding. Shavi can mean the heart or it can mean a rooster. Now, the rest of it says to distinguish between day and night. I don't know how many of you have ever owned chickens, but last year we had a bunch of chickens that we owned. And one of the interesting things about chickens is chickens are very attuned to day and night. As soon as sundown starts to happen, they all go into their coop and they get on their perch and they begin to shut down and go to sleep. And while it's dark, they sleep. And when the sun gets up, they wake up. All right. Chickens are like the hens, the females are like clockwork, okay? They go into their thing. That's why you will never hear chickens at night unless you live in a place where there's a lot of artificial lighting. Then you might have a problem. And in fact, that's part of the reason that a lot of uh, residential communities do not allow roosters. So what does a rooster do when the sun comes up? He crows, right? cock a doodle doo or whatever they say, right? That's not what they say, but that's how we say what they say. So roosters crow to announce the rising of the morning sun. The problem is, is that most of us live in areas where there's at least some artificial lighting. Um, you know, you have street lights, you have lights on the outside of the house, you have cars coming down the road. And, um, oh, there we go. It's, it, for some reason, there's a huge delay on me seeing the comments. Uh, and so what happens is, is that the roosters will be confused by the artificial lights, thinking that it's daytime or that, I mean, that the rise, the sun is rising when it's like two o'clock in the morning and they'll start crowing and they'll be really obnoxious and annoy your neighbors. So uh, a lot of residential communities will, while they may allow chickens, will definitely not allow roosters. So it's really interesting because the rooster knows the difference between day and night. It's second nature to them, all right? But it's also second nature to us as human beings. I don't know if you know this, but when you sleep, you need to sleep in near total darkness. If you do not sleep in total or near total darkness, your body will not produce the amount of hormones that it needs for you to be healthy. Um, when we sleep, our body produces certain hormones that it only produces in total darkness. The same is true during the day. Our body only produces certain hormones in light as well. And so our body understands the difference between day and night. And uh, it's actually a problem in our modern age because we're all sitting in front of computers all day long and into the evening, into the night. I mean, you know, 200 years ago, um, yes, you had night owls, but not like you have today. Insomnia is far worse because the, um, with all of the artificial lighting. And in fact, I teach a class to uh, high schoolers. And one of the things that we talk about is sleep hygiene. If they're having trouble falling asleep, they need to turn off their computers and their phones and all of that a half an hour before they need to go to bed, which is very hard in this modern generation, right? We're all like on, we're laying in bed, looking at the phone, right? And, um, but it's really important for our body to be able to shut down and start to the process of going to sleep. In order to do that, we have to, get away from the artificial lighting. We need to be in darkness. And, um, you know, hundreds of years ago, they, they had candles that they would read by, which is still a light source, 
but it's not to the level that the light coming from our computers and our phones are giving us. Now, I know a lot of people have programs on their phones and their computers that change the color of the light so that it's not supposed to disrupt your sleep cycle as much. But back to the prayer, moda ani. So creatures, human beings and animals, especially like, for example, the rooster, which is why there's this interesting difference in the translation between shekhvi, between the rooster and the heart, is that both roosters and human beings have an understanding of the difference between day and night. So we start the morning brachot with a thanksgiving to Hashem for giving us the ability to distinguish between day and night. Okay? The second bracha says, Baruch atah Hashem elokeinu melech haolam shalo asani goy. All right? Blessed are you, I think that's the second one, right? Yeah. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who did not make me a Gentile. There's a, there's a few prayers in this section that are complicated and difficult for people to digest, all right? Why would we thank God for not making us a non-Jew, all right? There's also thanking God for not making us a slave. That's the next one. Baruch atah Hashem elokeinu melech alam shalom asani of it, who did not make me a slave. Um, and the purpose, the reason for making these brachas, remember we're, we're stopping and we're thanking God for making us who we are. And we're thanking Hashem for giving us the mitzvot that he has given us. All right. And he's given the Jewish people a specific and special relationship with God that is different from the relationship that he has given to the rest of the nations. So what if you were born a non-Jew? What if you were born a boy? So it's interesting. There's actually a disagreement as far as what converts are supposed to say when they say this prayer. My husband was told to say, um, instead of saying, Shalo Asani Goy, who did not make me a Goy, sh he sh should say, She Asani, who did make me a Ger. Okay? Now, there are others who say no, that even though you had to convert, if you've converted to Judaism, there's this idea that you were given a Jewish soul in a non-Jewish body, but your soul is still Jewish. And so you also say, Shaloha Sanigoy. So really the truth is, is that the, um, the answer is to talk to your rabbi if you have one. Um, otherwise, choose one or the other to say, you know, depends on your personal philosophy, I guess. Um, my husband says, She'asani ger, who has made me a ger, all right? Because Torah and uh, the Talmud puts a very special, holds the ger as a very precious and special position. And so um, that's not something to be ashamed of, you know, being a ger, is a very special thing. And, and I know that sometimes it's hard to be grateful for that, you know, because it means that there are many things that have been more difficult for you. But to stop and to thank Hashem for that as well, because as we'll get into actually, when we get to the prayer on the woman, is that it's really important for us to stop and recognize that God made us who we are because he made us exactly the way that we need to be in order to, the, to accomplish the very unique calling that each of us has in this world. We each have a different calling. And the training that each of us needs in order to fulfill that calling is going to be different. And so if you were created a Gentile, and um, whether or not you feel that you've always had a Jewish soul or, or whatever, the fact is, and, and whether or not it gives you challenges in life, those challenges, God felt that you needed those challenges in order to be able to do what it is that you need to do in this world, okay? So we say the blessing, Shalom Asani Goy, who did not make me a non-Jew, or She Asani Ger, who has made me a Ger, all right? The next one was Shalom Asani Ovid, who did not make me a slave. And the point of these who did not make me that part of the series of prayers is 
because what we're doing is we're thanking Hashem for making me exactly the way that he needed to make me. Exactly, because he in his wisdom knew exactly what I would need in order to accomplish my calling in this world, okay? All right. So, the next bracha, which is one that is, you know, somewhat controversial, I would say, is, Baruch atah Hashem elokeinu melech alam she lo asani isha, if you're a man, and she asani kirtso no, if you're a woman. So if you're a man, the blessing is, blessed are you, Hashem, our God, King of the universe, who did not make me a woman. And if you are a woman, it's blessed are you, Hashem, our God, King of the universe, who made me according to his will. Now, I'm very, very frustrated because I have a whole set of notes on this somewhere else, and I'm not sure where they are or why they're not in this set of notes. But this is a very difficult prayer to, or part of the prayer to, to for a lot of people to deal with. And I really hope that there's just nobody commenting because I want to hear your comments if you have any. Um, this is a very challenging thing because it sounds like the men are saying, you know, oh, thank you for not making me an icky woman. But the the truth is, is that um, the man is thanking Hashem that he has give, been given all of these obligations because the truth is, is that without those obligations, he might not connect to God in the way that he needs to connect to God. So it's a time, it's a moment to stop for you guys and not think of it in terms of I'm not a woman, but rather that Hashem saw that you were uniquely made in a way that it's harder for you to connect with him. And so you were given these mitzvot, these commandments, to draw you closer and to bring you in and to force you to connect in a way that you wouldn't uh, connect if you weren't commanded to. In fact, they've done a lot of studies with non-Jews and among Christians, for example, um, when um, in certain populations, most populations, as far as I know, uh, churches have far higher attendance by women than men. The men just don't naturally, they're, they're much more concerned with, you know, I need to work, I need to build, I need to do. And so even though they recognize that there is a need for a spiritual connection with God, they don't necessarily um, connect just voluntarily. And so by having all of these commandments, they are being forced to stop and to connect uh, with God with Hashem. The reason that the women are given the prayer, She Asani Kirtsono, who has made me according to his will, is the one thing that seems to distinguish women from men, at least for the most part. Obviously, anytime you talk about gender, you're going to have a wide variety. Um, you know, there's stereotypes and then there's people who don't fit the stereotypes because not everybody is built the same. And we have men who have a more feminine side and women who have a more masculine side, even within the traditional gender roles. Um, however, most women are extremely critical of themselves, especially physically, but also in what we do, right? We're always competing with each other. We're always looking at ourselves in the mirror. We're upset about the the zit on the side of our nose or, you know, we gained a couple of pounds and now this outfit doesn't look right or, or whatever. And um, we're extremely critical of ourselves. And so this meditation, if you will, this bracha is to force us to stop and to think about the fact that God made us exactly the way we're supposed to be made. And so I like to share with my students that this is an opportunity for you to stop for a minute and to thank God for the things about you that you don't like. Because he gave you those because you need those too. I need my big nose for some reason. It's important, it's part of the training pack, it's part of the package that I need in order to be able to do the things that I need to do in this world. And so I feel like it's extremely important to stop at this prayer and to actually concentrate and meditate and thank God for all of the challenges that he's given you. If you are a gear, if you are a convert and a person of color, 
or Asian or whatever else, you know, those are things that are going to give you unique challenges in life. And it's very easy to be upset about them. And yet Hashem decided that that was what you needed. Your neshama needed to be in that body because you need those set of challenges in order to accomplish what you need to accomplish in the world. Baruch atah Hashem elokeinu melech ha'olam pokeach yivrim. Right? Blessed are you, Hashem our God, King of the universe, who gives sight to the blind. Okay, still here. Good. All right. Um, I'm just going to kind of swing through these really quickly so that I can actually like finish up because we're getting late. Baruch atah Hashem elokeinu melech ha'olam malbish arimim. Blessed are you, Hashem, our God, King of the universe, who clothes the naked. Baruch atah Hashem Elokeinu Melech Alam Matir Asurim, who releases the bound. And there's a lot that we could say about the words um, releasing the bound and, and the difference between Matir and uh, Asurim, Asur. Um, Baruch atah Hashem Elokeinu Melech Alam Zokef Kifufim, who straightens the bent. Baruch atah Hashem Elokeinu Melech Alam Rokah Ha'aretz Al Hamayim, who spreads out the earth upon the waters. Baruch atah Hashem Elokeinu Melech Alam Hamechin Mitzade Gaver, who establishes the footsteps of man. Baruch atah Hashem Elokeinu Melech Alam Sha'asa Li Kol Tzarchi, Tzarchi. Um, who has provided me with all my needs. By the way, this bracha is omitted on fast days. It's interesting because one of the things we're doing on a fast day is we're specifically denying ourselves our need because eating is a need, right? Um, so we're specifically denying ourselves something that we need in order to accomplish something more spiritual and more important. But, um, but generally speaking, God provides all our needs, okay? But um, when we're fasting, we leave that off. Baruch atah Hashem elokeinu melech alam ozer Yisrael b'gevora, who girds Israel with strength. Baruch atah Hashem elokeinu melech alam oter Yisrael b'tifara, who crowns Israel with splendor. Baruch atah Hashem elokeinu melech alam hanoten le'ya'ev koach, who gives to the weary strength. And I don't know if you can tell, but I'm starting to get a little weary. Okay, now, just so that you know, after those 14 short blessings, there are two more blessings, all right, which are general purpose blessings. And it ends with the word Gehinom. Um, that prayer starts with Yehiwetzon. Okay, and then you'll see that the next set of prayers is called the Akeda. All right, now, if your sitter did not include the blessings over the Torah before the morning blessings, this is where you're going to find them. Now, in my Siddur, the blessings for men putting on the Talit, as I mentioned at the beginning, and the Tefillin were at the very beginning. In the Sephardi Siddur I was using when I compiled these notes, they're placed here at this place after the morning brachot. There are also a few other prayers included at this point in the Sephardi Siddur that are not in my Siddur. So if you have a Sephardi Siddur, you'll, you'll see those, right? Then we come to a section called the Akedah. And this is a recitation of the story of the binding of Isaac and the primary reason that no matter where they were actually put in the preliminary blessings, at this point, we can't proceed if we haven't said the blessings over the Torah because we're about to read a section of the Torah, all right? So this officially ends the preliminary prayers, usually referred to as the morning blessings. When I get up in the morning, I get up, right? I say moda'ani. I wash my hands, I go to the bathroom, I wash my hands again, and I say, Alnatila Yadayim and Asher Yatsar. Right? Then I get dressed, do whatever I need to do, not eat, get dressed. Then I start with actually Reshi Tchachma. You can say Moda'ani again if you want to, because first of all, it doesn't have Hashem's name, so there's nothing in being done in vain. Um, and then I say the brachot over the Torah, and I say the um, morning blessings, and then I stop so that I can have my coffee and breakfast, all right? Now, if you look 
on the event page, I uploaded a chart, a picture of a chart. And if you can't download it or something, let me know and I'll make sure that you get a copy of it. Um, this is, a, is called a summary of priorities for women with limited time for shacharit. This comes from a book called Rigshe Lev, which is written by Rabbi Menachem Nissel, and it's about women and prayer, and it outlines all of the laws and customs. In his book, he lays out the order of priorities for prayer for women. If you are brand new to praying from the sitter, I highly recommend you use this chart. Actually, there are people who have been doing this for a very long time who also are using this chart. Start with the column all the way on the left. If you have the ability right now to open up that, go to the event page and open up. I say, I don't have the ability to share on this. I think I may go back to using Zoom for next week. Um, all right. If you look at the chart, there are nine columns. And the first column, or 10 columns, I guess if you include, with all of the different major uh, headings of the um, shacharit service, starting with the morning brachot. Now on this chart, which I said I posted on the event page, and you can download it to your computer, and I highly recommend that you print it off and put it in your sitter, it has these columns that are che have check marks in them. And each column is getting progressively more checked because it's for, depending on how much time you have. The less time you have, you start with the left column. If you have more time than that, you go on and you move up and, until the column that has, has everything checked. All right, now, uh, this is called the priority of prayers for women, but if you are a man, it's still important to know if you're praying in a minion and you are a slow prayer, as many men who are beginning are, there are things that you can leave out in order to stay with the kahila, with the congregation. Um, and this chart will help you to see what is most important. And if you're not feeling well or you missed minion or there's something going on and you don't have enough time to pray the entire shacharit, this priority chart will help you to be able to figure out what to pray and what to add if you have more time. Um, I will go into that a little bit more next week. We're really out of time. But if you look at the chart on the first column, you see four check marks, right? This is where you start. Or if you're experienced, then this is where what you should daven if you don't have a lot of time. The first check mark is for Birchat HaShachar, the morning brachot, which is what we looked at today. Now, if you go down the column, saying the prayers in order from top to bottom, I mean, you, you do, you go down the column saying the prayers in order from top to bottom. So after Birchat HaShachar, we see the next thing checked in the list is the first verse of the Shema. And that's where we will start next week. So thank you for joining me. I hope you all have a fantastic week. And I will see you next week.